What's up, Generation Church? How are we doing today? So good to see everybody. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Ben Pierce, my wife Melissa, and uh, today we're doing the message together, which we're excited about, and um, so we look forward to meeting you. Those of you guys that are new to the family, welcome home. Our church family online, so glad you guys have tuned in. Can we just give it up one more time for all those that are new? All right, so we are starting a new series today, and uh, the name of the series is um, Between, Between the, Chaos. the Chaos. Thank you. It's, it's only the third time I've said that today. Um, <laughs> Between the Chaos, and you know, this series really is, uh, it, it's designed to be a help to us as we navigate the crazy chaos that our world is, and between the pages of the scripture are the answers that you're looking for, yeah. and so we want to take this series and, and, and really just pull out of the book of Daniel useful uh, biblical references and, and tips and tools and theology that, that will help you navigate a crazy world. And Melissa actually is the one who came up with this idea, so we're going to collaborate on it. We're going to do all four sessions uh, together. So I'm really excited about it. I want to encourage you to be here for all four sessions. Invite some friends and family to, to come be a part of it as well, because I think it's going to be extremely value added uh, to you. You know, I, I as I was praying about the series, I, I didn't know I was praying about the series. I didn't know I was praying about a series. I was just praying and asking God to guide me as I raise two young boys in today's world. And how, how am I as a Christian parent, as a Christian leader, as a, as a Christian human, um, to just show up uh, and, and bring answers to two young boys that are going to have questions? Because they questions. some of the people, they do have questions. They have lots of questions. And you should never be afraid of your kids' questions. Um, but I, as I, what I realized was that, um, you know, in this crazy world that we're living in, 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 in this difficult world that we're living in, that if I were searching for these answers, if I'm praying for, for, for how I'm supposed to show up, then you probably are too. You're probably asking God, like, how am I a Christian in 2023? What do I, how, how do I be, which I know is not correct English, um, but how, how do I be in 2020? Like, how do I live? How am I? Whether you're a parent or not, this message is for you because some of the people that I observe standing up for their faith um, some of the people that I observe who are standing up, let's say, um, to maybe some of the evil in the world, I, I don't want to be like them. I see very few good examples of, of people who are standing up and, and, and doing something in the name of Jesus um, in a way that I feel like I really want to emulate. And so I was asking and I was seeking and I was searching and, and I felt like God took me to the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we see young men who stood up for their faith and stood out with their excellence. They had this faith-fueled excellence that they lived um, in, in, in a world full of evil. And I believe that God is calling us to that because their faith-fueled excellence, their, their standing up and standing out actually brought influence. Yeah, and that influence brought actual change in their day. And so I'm praying that over these four weeks that you're going to get some of the answers that you've been seeking, that you're going you're gonna to get some truth from God's word that is going to sustain you in 2023 and beyond. So let's start with some fun today. Can we have some fun in church? Yes. Uh, a little uh, audience participation. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about this message and, and just praying about it and, um, you know, asking the Lord to give us, give me something that would benefit you and, and be useful. I started thinking about the culture we live in and, and how just crazy it is. I mean, it's just chaotic. Like the, in the past few years, the world has uh, transitioned in ways I, I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. And, um, and so I'm just curious for you guys, here's the question. Do you feel like the world is more chaotic today than it was in biblical times? Lift your hand. Yes, no. Worse today than it was in, let's say, Daniel's day. Okay, how many of you guys feel like it was worse in Daniel's day than it is today? Okay, so, you know, I think sometimes in, in our, our walk with God and as we're navigating our culture and, and trying to be a Christian and stand up and stand out in, in our world, I think we sometimes can look at it and think, man, this is, this is crazy. Like, I can't do anything. You know, this used to be kind of like a, 
a, a binary system. It was like evil versus good, but it's no longer that way. I mean, their culture is no longer defined by MTV and, and our, our movies. Culture is defined by anybody that has a, a YouTube page or a social media account. It's like all these little micro cultures swirling around us. And, and now we find ourselves not in a uh, us versus them mentality or battle. Literally, the average Christian living in a post-Christian world is, is existing in a sea of culture that is swirling around them and ever-changing. It's hard to keep up with, with all of that. And, um, you know, I, I think it's helpful for us to gain some perspective around the day in which we live. Because the reality is, the last time you stood up for your faith at the office, they didn't uh, throw you in the lion's den. You or know, the fiery they, furnace. Huh? Or the fiery furnace. Or the fiery furnace. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't live in a nation that was captured by, you know, the Babylonians and you're carried off into exile. So I, I think it's helpful. And I'm not trying to demean the struggle that modern day Christians have. We do have a struggle, but I do want to put it in, into perspective that what we unpack out of Daniel's story was that they stood up for their faith and they stood out in their excellence in a culture that is more difficult than the culture we live in today. I know cancel culture is a real threat, so you don't want to be canceled, but if Daniel can do it, you can do it. And I believe that this series is just going to help give you the tools that you need to stand up and be the person that God's called you to be. So what can we learn from Daniel about how to navigate the turbulent waters of culture? You know, Daniel and his friends has been referenced. They were, they were young men who lived in Judah, and they were Jews. They were Jewish young boys who were living their life, being raised by their parents, being raised and trained in God's laws. And one day their nation was attacked, and they were carried off to the nation of Babylon, the, the, the country of Babylon, and they were forced to live in the king's court. They were entering a three-year program where they were going to um, eat the king's food and, and learn the language of the Chaldeans, which was the people of that day, and astrology, and all of these different things that they, they were forced to learn. And this nation, Babylon, was completely foreign to anything that they grew up with, anything that they believed, um, like society and life and relationships and, and should be like. Um, Babylon is actually, the, the word Babylon literally means confusion. Confusion. And Ben made this point that I thought was so good, that, that Babylon is not really a geography, it's a mentality. It's a mentality of confusion, of darkness, of, 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 of not understanding and having a very unstable foundation around what truth is and where truth comes from. And so these young men, they're, they're forced to live in the king's court, and all of a sudden, you know, um, all these things start happening to them that they could not, they could not protect themselves from. And uh, the first thing, the first point that we have for today is this. And Ben would give his spiel on where to get your point. So I'll let oh, you do that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you so just keep service, going. I'm just like, yeah. I'm, I'm set back and have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, if you want to take some notes, I do encourage you to take notes uh, on the app store. You can get the app. They're all written out there for you. You can write it on a Connect card, whatever you want to do. Your neighbor's arm works as well. Um, but Daniel chapter 1, as we start to unpack this passage of Scripture, beginning in verse 3, says this. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, if you're looking for boy names, uh, his chief of staff, to it's a great boy name, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah, of the royal family and of the noble families, who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Now, I think it's important to understand about Babylon. You know, Babylon started in the, in the Shinar Valley. The Tower of Babel was built there. It, it goes through Nebuchadnezzar's reign and Darius and Cyrus and a bunch of other kings. And it goes all the way through to the book of Revelation. Uh, in the book of Revelation, um, you know, Babylon is, is the symbol of, 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 the, of Satan, really, honestly, the kingdom of darkness. And, um, and so to understand what these guys are dealing with is not just a, uh, a captivity by a nation, but they literally have been cap captivated or, or um, um, taken over by the enemy and the enemy's mentality. They're living in the middle of this place, Babylon. Babylon is the first place that sin transitioned from a personal sin to a corporate sin. When they got together and they said, we're going to build this tower to heaven so that we can make a name for ourselves, that's when humanity was no longer sinning individually. Cain killed Abel, that's an individual sin. The Tower of Babel and the creation of Babylon is where it began to get together. So culture, a sinful culture was built out of that, and it carries all the way through 
to the book of Revelation. And so these guys are in Babylon as captives. This is the worst, but it's like being captive by the devil. And it says, verse 4, select only strong and healthy, good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter into royal service. And so if you want to take some notes, the first thing that I want you to write down today about this message is that culture will try to captivate your children. These guys were the youths of of the Jewish people, and they were the people that were selected by Babylon to be uh, conscripted into this program to be trained for three years. And as we talk about standing up for our faith, we got to know that our next generation is really the starting point. And we have to stand up for them. Um, we have to we have to be prepared to train them. And if you're here today and you're not yet a parent or you're not a parent, um, that's okay because there's people who you influence. Yeah. There are people in your life that you um, that that you're modeling something for them, whether that is a extended family member, people that you work with, um, you know, whatever it is in your life, you have to recognize that your influence matters and that culture is is trying to captivate whomever that is. And so the scripture tells us in Proverbs 22, 6, to train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yeah, you know, I think it's an important thing to know about Daniel and, and his friends. And we'll unpack who these guys are in a few minutes. But you know, they grew up in, in Jewish culture, and they had been taught all about God. That, that was their foundation. So when they were captured by the Babylonians and they were put in this training program, they were able to stand firm in what they believed. God's word was already ingrained in them. And I think it's an important thing for us to, to know today that God's word and taking him at his word, what he says about your life, how to live life, the standards that you should hold as believers, that all of that matters, and God's word works. Like God's way works. And so even though they were conscripted into this program and they were taught intensely for three years, they were able to hold on to their faith and their beliefs. And, and so I don't care where your kids are in life. The word of God is true. If you'll train them when they're young, they may have some rough years, but they will never depart from it. And you can take that one to the bank. And so as we talk about this, how do we... How do we do this with our families? How do we do this personally? I mean, maybe you don't have kids or maybe you're a grandparent or whatever. How, how do you teach and train yourself the word of God so that whatever culture throws at you, you're not swayed by it? You know, as a family, we read through the Bible together. We tell Bible stories and we don't depend on um, anyone else or anything else to shape the values of God's word for our children. Like, we start off with the mentality that we are responsible. Like, I'm responsible. Um, Nothing else is responsible. It's not, you know, Robbie's responsibility, who is our children's uh, coordinator and pastor. It's not anyone's responsibility but my own to be sure that God, um, that my children understand. At least they understand, and then they have the opportunity to make their own choices. And I would say to the adults in the room, too, it is your responsibility for you personally. Yeah. It's not the life group program at your local church. It's not my responsibility to make sure that you are a solid Christian. I'm here to strike the match every week. But if you don't go home on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and dig in and learn it yourself, you're never going to get what you need as a foundation in a, in a 30 or 40 minute message each week. The other thing is... I just um, got myself off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, Man, I started laughing, and I thought I lost my train of thought. That's all right. Yeah, go for it. You can tell the Hudson story. Okay, so, so Melissa's right. We, you know, we all take responsibility, and we should take responsibility for our spirituality. If you want to be able to stand up in your culture, it starts with you. And so, you know, for Hudson, we partner with, and for Ethan too, we partner with Jupiter Christian School where he goes. We partner with uh, the the youth program and the student program here as well, and and it makes a, an impact. And so the other night. You know, I'm putting Hudson to bed, and I always read him stories or poems or, or something, and, um, and he starts crying. And, um, and I look over, and I'm like, buddy, what, what's going on? Why are you crying? And uh, he said, Daddy, I, I, I don't want you to grow older. Too and late. 
I was like, I was like, listen, dude, I ain't that much older than your buddy's daddies. Okay, come on now. Um, don't let the gray hair fool you. It's just wisdom. And, um, and he said, I, I'm, I don't want to grow older than four. And I was like, why, why buddy? And he said, I don't want you to breathe your last breath. And I don't want to be alone. And it opened a door for me to have a conversation with my four-year-old about eternity and about heaven. And the reason why that conversation happened is because through the month of July in the kids' ministry, they're teaching the preschoolers about salvation. And so why do I know that? Because I get the emails from the kids' church, which if you're not signed up for that, you need to get those. And in those emails, it tells you what your you know, breakfast time conversation should be, your cuddle time, your dinner time. You know, it gives you um, insight into what they're learning there so you can have productive conversations with your kids. And so I had the opportunity to, to walk Hudson through them and say, listen, buddy, first of all, I obeyed my mom and dad and I honored them, so I'm going to live a long time. And, and I'm just getting started. And, and second of all, man, when I, I breathe my last breath, I'm going to be in heaven. And that's why it's important for you to make a place in your heart for God. And so these are moments that he will never forget. They're shaping his heart. And so we've got to teach and train our kids in that kind of fashion, partner together with those that we can. So good. You know, <clears throat> the scripture tells us in Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. Um, you know, parents have to protect their children from the culture so they can point them at the culture. You know, parents, parents are like an archer, the scripture tells us, and children are like an arrow. And the archer has to get ahead of the arrow and point it in the right direction, which means opening up conversations that might be difficult to have or controversial to have or, um, you know, painful for you or embarrassing for you as a parent to have um, so that you can point that arrow um, in a direction that is going to make a difference in the culture. Uh, one of the things that we do is we always talk about the why of things, always, always. Rather than um, saying don't, rather than saying no, rather than saying particularly as it comes to like media consumption and um, language that we use and that type of thing, rather than saying don't, we always say why. Um, and that really, helps un, uh, that really helps him understand to the degree that he can. Um, that helps our son understand to the degree that he can so that he can um, release that grip that he has on his desire for whatever it is he wants to do. Um, understanding releases submission. And when we understand something, have you ever been in a situation with someone where you're like, oh, how dare they? And then they explain something to you and everything just relaxes. Our kids are no different. They, that why is an incredibly powerful and incredibly helpful tool um, that we can use in our relationship with them. Yeah. You know, rules without relationship will breed rebellion in your kids and in anybody, in any relationship that you have. And so the why is, is huge. And so we look for opportunities in life to prove God's word works. And so when we have conversations around this is how we do life, this is what God says is our standard and then when we see that come to pass in everyday life, I pointed out to Hudson, I'm saying, see, remember we had that conversation. This is why, because that's how it turns out. And we also point out the negative. This is why we don't do that, because when we do it this way, this is, or that way, this is how it turns out. So Hudson came to me the other day, and he was like, um, he was like, Dad, if kids smoke, do their parents go to jail? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> no, I didn't. But he's, he's asking those questions, and, um, and so we're teaching him and, and training him. So protecting, I know there's maybe a little bit of like, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, people look down on this idea of sheltering your kids or protecting your kids, and I'm not advocating that you shelter your kids. I'm advocating that you protect them while you teach them. You protect them while you train them so that they are equipped when they come of age to be pointed at this world so that they can make a difference for the kingdom of God. So good. The second point this week is that culture will try to change your identity. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a human, because that's what we all are in this room, um, man, woman, whatever, culture will try to change your identity. 
Um, it will try to um, speak things over you, define you, shape you in a way that God never intended Confuse you. for you. Um, we see with Daniel and his friends, you know, we know them as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they actually had other names. Um, the scripture tells us that um, in Daniel chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that were their original Hebrew names, were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. Yeah, so, you know, if you grew up in church, you probably know them by their Babylonian names before you know them by their God-given names. And I think it's an important point to, to um, pull out of this or tease out of this because their God-given names were their real identity. But thousands of years later, most of us don't know Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as their names. We, we know the counterfeit name. And so culture is trying to counterfeit uh, who you are in God, trying to always shift you or confuse you or get you and your kids or your grandparents or anybody who's breathing to, to misunderstand who God created them to be. And we see this in our culture in a huge way now. But listen to this. So Daniel's name uh, means God is my judge. That's what Daniel means. When they gave him the name Belshazzar, it literally means lady, protect the king. So even in Daniel's day, gender confusion and gender identity was an issue and a, a weapon of the enemy. Um, Hananiah's name means Yahweh has been gracious. But Shadrach means I'm now fearful of God. From a God who was gracious to me to now a God that I'm afraid of. Misael's name was who is what God is. It, it's a, a, name, a, a name that means I'm in awe of God. I stand in wonder and amazement of God. His name was changed to Meshach. And that means I'm despised, contemptible, and humiliated. Azariah, his name means Yahweh has helped me. And Abednego, his name means servant of Nebo, which is the Babylonian god that Nebuchadnezzar was named after. And so as families, we, we need to spend time um, exploring who we are in Christ. Those, those identities are, are first and foremost. What's interesting about Daniel and the friends and the names is that um, the behavior of Daniel and his friends all throughout the book, which we're going to unpack over this series, um, never is in alignment with the names that they were given. They had such a strong foundation in God's laws and in God's ways that the name that the Babylonian king placed on them, Babylonian culture placed on them, had no effect on, on their outcomes. And in the same way, whatever confusing, identity-shaping thing that the enemy is trying to throw at your kids or trying to, to confuse you with, um, it, it can, can, have, can have no impact. That with the right foundation, with the right um, training, with the right beliefs, with clear conviction around God and his word, um, you can make it through this culture with your faith intact. Yeah. It's so important. Uh, you said something in the earlier service that uh, sparked this thought in me. You know, in, in the banking industry, they never teach the bank tellers what the counterfeits look like. They only teach them what the real thing looks like. And if you want the best tactic that you can have for helping your family and your kids know their identity in God, don't combat the identities that are trying to be placed on them. Just teach them who they are. Yes. You're a child of God. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're above and not beneath. You're the head and not the tail. You are his workmanship. If you teach them who they are, when the counterfeit comes, they'll recognize it. If you don't take the time to unpack who God says that your kids and your family and even you are, when the counterfeit comes, you'll take that bait, hook, line, and sinker. And Genesis 127 says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. And even though on the internet there are 107 different gender identities that are, are uh, published, there's still just man and woman. And that's who God created. And you have to reinforce God's word and take him at his word and teach them the real thing. 
you know, if you as the, um, as a person, if you as a parent, if as you as an influence in someone else's life, if you um, can begin to instill that deep sense of belief um, ab about being God's creation, being the object of God's affection, um, and the intentionality with which God created you um, and created your children, then you're getting ahead of the issue. Good. You're getting ahead of it, and you're able to, to build that in very explicitly. See, the scripture that Ben just read about being made in the image of God is was like a generally accepted idea five years ago or ten years ago. Um, we all just like sort of assumed that that was a given and like check, boom, moving on from that. Let's like learn about Revelation. Um, but I think we actually have to go back to those very basic fundamentals and recognize that they are absolutely key um, to the basic doctrines of our faith. Right. And that that basic doctrine of being created by God perfectly and intentionally um, is a real defining factor of our faith. And those are the types of things that we need to be instilling in our kids so that, um, you know, it's not just culture happening to them, but them happening to culture. And we actually see that in Daniel and his friend's life. So they're there in the king's court. Um, we read that that uh, they, not only were they given new names, but they were going to be given a, a portion of the king's food every single day and wine. They were not used to drinking wine, and they were not used to eating the types of foods that they ate in Babylon. It was in direct contradiction to God's law. And that's hard for us to understand now because we don't have or live under any kind of dietary laws. I mean, the, the biggest thing that probably most of the people uh, deal with in this room is like, should I eat the ice cream? I'm lactose intolerant. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, Gluten-free, ah, oh, should I take the risk? Um, this is not that. This, is, this was part of their daily religious yeah. Life and it was in conflict with God's law. And so we see an example here where in the scripture, we're going to read in just a second, where Daniel, he stands up for his faith. He stands up for God's law, but in a way that is so excellent. Yeah. It's so excellent. And so the scripture says in um, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 14, but Daniel was determined. He purposed, the New King James Version says, not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke to the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please, he said. This is Daniel talking. Please. Please. Who's offended by please? Please. Test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. You know, this passage of scripture is um, just, I mean, it's really unbelievable to think about a young man who is asking the attendant of a king in a foreign land if he can make an accommodation for his diet because it's in contradiction to God's law. And it wasn't just really about the food for Daniel, because Daniel purposed in his heart yeah. not to defile himself, meaning not to, um, not, not, not to break God's law. And so in a culture like we live in today where it is confusing and it is dark, have you purposed in your heart? Have you purposed in your heart? Have you determined that no matter what the culture throws at you, that you're not going to defile yourself? Right. Now, that's not with, you know, a steak dinner and a glass of wine. Um, that is going to be with maybe what you watch or who you associate with or how you, how, how you consume the culture around you. Um, but what is it that you're consuming that might be defiling you? 
And like Daniel, have you, have you done that? Have you purposed in your heart um, that you're not going to eat the king's food? And then what's going to happen when you do that is people around you are going to take notice. In Daniel's case, it was the attendant to the king and all of that. And they have this sort of back and forth dialogue around, um, you know, if the king knows, people are going to ask you the difference. They're going to know the difference. And you don't have to become a radical, angry, uh, over-political Christian believer to... um, to state your case and, and, and really the strength of your faith. Like Daniel, you can just say, please, would you observe me for a while? Well, I think one of the reasons why we see people who are standing up for their faith in our modern day get overly angry or overly political is because honestly, there's a fear in there that what they espouse to believe uh, is, is not going to come to pass. And it really comes back to believing the word of God and taking the word of God at face value. And so when, when we stand up for our faith, if we don't truly believe that God's word is going to come to pass, then we'll try to add in our own passions, our own politics, our own belief system to try to undergird that. But if you take the time to develop your faith and take God at his word, if you don't walk away from anything else from today's session, it's this. What God says about you is going to come to pass. What God says about how to live, it is truth. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what the science says. Follow the science. God created science. All of those things. If you can get yourself to the place where your faith is so strong in God's word that when something contradicts it, you stand up for it in an excellent manner, then the world is going to see the difference. They're going to see where you're excelling. They're going to see where God's truth is coming to bear in your everyday life. You know, excellence really comes from confidence. And we see in Daniel's story an excellence of communication. He, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't crazy. He wasn't angry. He wasn't, he wasn't afraid. And, and oftentimes, like Ben talked about, that, that passion that we inject into whatever we believe, it comes from a place of anger. And we know from psychology that um, in anger, we have two responses often, or three responses, but two we'll focus on today, which is fight or flight. And a lot of the fighting that we feel we have to do, we're fighting because we're angry. We're angry because we're afraid. And for many of us, we're not just defiled by the um, whatever it is that we're taking in in culture that isn't good, but we're defiled by the fear. The fear is, drives us to either shut down and, and run away or, or, or to fight in a manner that is, um, you know, not, not really not who we, yeah, not Christ-like or who we want to be. And so maybe for some of, some of us, you're looking out at the world and you've been really afraid. Who's going to be the next president? What's going to happen to the economy? Is there going to be a recession? Will I be laid off? How am I going to deal with all the agendas with my kids? I'm afraid of the school that they're in. All of this fear. But the scripture tells us in 1 John that perfect love casts out fear. And if you want to deal with the fear of the culture, then you must receive the perfect love of God. And the reason, the way to receive the perfect love of God is, is to get into the scripture and really begin to meditate on his perfect love. It will cast the fear out. When the fear is cast out, then um, the communication is not angry and, and overwrought. When the communication is excellent, like we see with Daniel, because Daniel really, that excellence came from confidence, confidence in who? Confidence in God. Right. And the same thing can happen for you. The fear can leave, the love can fill, the anger can go, and you can live in this culture in a way that honors God and influences people. Yeah, and people will see that. So here's a third point that I want you to know, that culture is going to challenge your belief in God's word. It just is. It is going to be contrary to it. And so you've got to make sure that you have full confidence in God's word. You know, what we do with our kids is we, we look for the opportunities to prove to them that God's word works. Hey, I told you this. Remember I told you that? Here's the example of how that works. This is a real life example. That carries so much weight. And so for all of us to know that that challenge is coming causes us to to hopefully get to a place where we build our confidence in God's word and we take him at his word. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, that your word is a lamp to my feet 
and a light to my path. So in a chaotic, confused culture world that we live in, where do you find your source of direction? It has to be from God's word. And when you take him at his word, his word does not fail. So um, a couple quick things as we get ready to wrap up today. Just some practicals on how do you do that. Well, you know, James 121 tells us that we have to be a hearer of the word. But it's not just being in groups or coming to church or reading the Bible or listening to podcasts. It's also being a doer. There are a lot of people who hear a lot of Bible and they hear a lot of God's truth, but they don't actually do much with it. They sit in a, a pew on a weekend or they sit in a chair at a church and they hear more and more and more of God's word. But my question is, what are you doing with it? Because the next scripture tells us if you are only a hearer and not a doer, then you're going to be a deceived person. And so my challenge to you is take God at his word, learn it, put it in you, look up the 90 plus scriptures on who you are in Christ, but then don't just set on that knowledge. Get busy, serve in your church, go on a mission trip, Go change a child's life in the student ministry, in the kids' ministry. Go to, the, to motion with these guys next week and, and do something. Don't just sit back and spectate because you'll end up in a place where your own life is, is deceived in that. So faith requires you to stand up, but excellence is how you stand out. Um, so Daniel chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only the vegetables instead of the food and the wine provided for the others. Here's what you need to know. When you take God at his word, your situation will be better. And not only will it be better for you, the culture around you will see it. They'll take note of it. You don't have to be afraid of being canceled. You don't have to be afraid of being ridiculed as some religious zealot. Just let the chips fall where they may. This is how God designed life to be. This is how we're going to live our life. And test us. Just see how my family, see how my kids do living the way God prescribed a family to live. And just let the chips fall where they may. And I guarantee you that when you take God at his word, it will come to pass in your life. Everything that he spoke everything that he said. So as we get ready to, to close today, um, Isaiah 55, 11 says this. He says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing in which I sent it to do. You know, the culture of this world has a strong sway to it but it's not stronger than God's word. There's a lot of peer pressure. There's a lot of media pressure. There's a lot of school pressure. There's a lot of every kind of pressure that you can think of that's trying to sway you. But what God has said about you, it does not return empty. God's word is alive and it's active. It's a sharp two-edged sword. It reveals the heart and intent of mankind. God's word does what it says it does. And you can take that to the bank. It does not return void. It accomplishes what it's supposed to do. And as we unpack this series over the next few weeks, my encouragement to you is to stand up for that word. Stand up for your faith. Stand up in excellence. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to add anything to it. Just let God's word be what it is. It speaks for itself. So I want to take a moment. I want to just pray for you as we get ready to close today. For all of you that are, are followers of God, would you just close your eyes with me for a moment? Father, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice online and in-house that is a child of God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that you would just begin to deal with our hearts. God, that you would create in us just a, a sense of boldness and understanding of your word, a, a, a faith and a confidence that your word is true. That God, we can live out your word. We can live the way the Bible says that we should live and we actually will do better and that, that the culture will see that and it will be a witness to our world. So Holy Spirit, would you just begin to speak that to your sons and to your daughters and would you, would you heal hurts and would you... Um, would you just do a work in, in us where we feel afraid? And I pray, God, that you're raising up a generation of people, young, middle, and old, right now, a generation of people that are gonna stand for your word. 
and it'll be a witness to this world. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. You know, some of you are here today and you may not have ever made Jesus the Lord of your life. You're not yet a child of God. The first step is always to become a child of God. You can't fix the sin problem in your life. You can't be good enough. You can't make enough money. You can't uh, be educated enough. You can't be nice enough. None of that. Good people don't make it to heaven. Redeemed people make it to heaven. And so you can't fix it yourself. The only way you can fix it is ask God to come into your heart and to make you a new person. And that requires you to stand up for him. The, the Bible actually tells us this in Matthew chapter 10 in the message translation. It says, stand up for me against world opinion and I will stand up for you before my Father in heaven. Maybe God's calling you today to stand up for Jesus. He's tugging on your heart. Would you pray with me? As I pray these words, would you say them with me under your breath? Would you believe them with your whole heart? And would you give your life to God today? Pray this with me. Say this, Father God, I want to know you more intimately. I want to be your child. God, would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of all of my sin? Would you make me a new person today, God? And would you help me to understand your word for my life, your laws for my life, your purpose for my life? God, today I give you all of me. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And with your eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer, we wanna take a moment and celebrate this because this is the most important prayer that you will have ever prayed in your life because this is the moment that you have secured your spot in eternity with God. Right now, the angels in heaven are rejoicing and throwing a party for those of you who have prayed that prayer and we wanna join them. And so I'm gonna to count to three. When I get to three, if you prayed that prayer, I wanna ask you just to lift your hand and uh, make eye contact with me. Those of you watching online, just in the privacy of your space and assigned to God, just lift your hand right where you are. Are you guys ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Go ahead and lift your hands up all across the room. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come on, Generation Church. Let's give it up for all those who are making commitments to Jesus today. So very proud of you.